So this is a moment of truth right here because this location of where the retaining wall is going to happen has to be in accordance with the plans exactly because these are all structural considerations about where on the width of the footing the wall happens and where inside the wall the rebar happens. What could I build with these hands that you gave me? Lord, with your wisdom, there's nothing I can make. I'll be damned if I waste a day. Rebar provides tensile strength for concrete. Concrete has very, very, very high compressive strength and very, very, very low tensile strength. So ferrous concrete, that is concrete with steel inside of it, is the only concrete that is good in structural situations where it'll resist compression and resist tension. Having said all that, the vertical mat of rebar needs to happen in the tension side of this wall. That is the side that is closest to the loading. The outside of the wall will be in compression, the inside of the wall will be in tension. So the engineer specified the distance from the wall to the edge of the footing, he specified the width of the wall, and he specified that the rebar, the verts on the rebar need to happen two inches from the inside face. If you look up this dig, <clears throat> you can see those steps. Those steps in that subgrade are gonna coincide with steps in the footing. But we're not going to put any boards on the edges. This is dirt bank pour. We're pouring right up against the dirt on both sides. The dirt had to be dug exactly in the right place, and they did that. Those steps needed to be put in approximately the right place so that we can put bulkheads, that is, forms to hold the concrete from running downhill, to create the concrete steps. The template that's going to hold the rebar is also going to help hold the bulkhead. It's sort of a, an integrated system where you don't put in any more than you have to, but you be sure to put in everything that you need to. This is the lower footing for the eight-foot wall. It's a big, heavy, cantilevered footing on the south edge of the property. Our house sites on top will be on top of this wall of dirt that we're covering with visqueen to keep the rain from supersaturating it and causing it to slide into the footing. The property on the left here that we are parking and walking and staging on actually belongs to the neighbor. And the wall we're building sits on our property, but only by about two inches. Now, the neighbor and I made a deal that was a win-win home run thing. I got a little money. He got the size of his lot increased. I got a place to stage or, you know, store and park and clean the forms and equipment and material that I would need to put these retaining walls in. This is an example of a job that would have been very difficult to do if I wouldn't have had space for staging and access. This is the rebar template. It comes in two pieces. These shorter 2x4s that are installed perpendicular to the edge form are set to grade. That is, the bottom of the 2x4 is at the top of concrete. Then I'll put the actual template that the rebar is going to tie to in place at exactly the right distance from the edge form to put the rebar verts two inches from the inside face of the wall. And it's got to be stout. I don't want these verts washing around, getting knocked out of line or out of plumb when the concrete sort of washes past them as it's being vibrated. Now the longitudinal template has to be out of the mud because I have to be able to finish underneath of it. Got to get it reasonably smooth well on both sides of that rebar so the Simons forms will sit nice and tidy down on the top of the footing. It has to be exactly in line with where the verts are coming out of the footing, two inches from the inside face, I will attach the verts exactly 12 inches on center. They must be embedded to exactly the right distance into the footing or perhaps a little more as they reach down into the keyway. And it all has to be done in a way that eventually I can take apart. It's kind of a trick. The, tem the template's gonna strip right along with the edge forms. I'll wait probably three days, which is enough on something like this. In fact, if I was careful, I could do it the next day, but I won't. Now keep in mind, even though engineers will tell you what all of the details and the specifications of your structure must be like when it's done, they never try to tell you how to do it. 
That's your problem. And sometimes it's a real problem. We're on the home stretch with these footings. Unlike the other footings you've been watching me put together, this footing has grade breaks. That is the elevation of the bottom of the footing steps. That complicates the process in several ways. First, the bottom of a footing should be poured on a level grade rather than sloping the bottom of the grade and having the footing slope. That perhaps that's it's obvious why, but forms are square. If you pour a sloped footing or a footing that's out of level, you then have to adjust or rip or sort of sacrifice part of your form system. And with a Simon's form system, that's not even an option. So that's item one. Item two is a footing needs to bear on a level substrate so that it is not tending to slide. So that gravity is not, you're not on a sloping subgrade that's gonna tend for that footing to slip down the hill over time and have to be restrained somewhere else. You set it on a level surface and it's gonna handle the loads more predictably. The outside corner of this wall system is gonna be right here. And from the face of the wall, we're going to come 16 inches to the edge of the first panel. That's a 6-inch filler and a 10-inch wall. From there, we switch over to 2-foot panels. 2-foot, two 2-foot. Two so the end of the third 2-foot panel is right here. That's where the bulkhead's got to occur. So looking at these white marks that I put on here when I was trying to estimate where the steps should be to accommodate the form layout, I think this was the first mark I made and then having a fit of sanity I moved it back to here and I should have moved it back maybe another 8 or 10 inches. So we're going to do just a little bit of pick and shovel work here, get rid of some of the nose on some of these steps so that there's lots of concrete in the throat of the step. So there's structural integrity as it transitions from the upper 12 inch rise to the lower 12 inch footing. There's got to be enough throat there to make that strong. Establishing these things is tricky. I mean, you got excavators there working and you got your shooting grade and you got guys waiting on you and you're trying to figure out what you're going to measure off of. And anyhow, you just do the best you can and understand that when you get to it, you've got two choices. You either buy more concrete or spend a little more labor. So what we just did was extend these bulkheads to where they're 12 inches net. A 2 by 12 is usually 11 and a quarter, 11 and 3 eighths. This is an old 2 by 12. I threw on a 3 quarter inch furring strip and we've got a nice tidy 12 inch bulkhead. So I've probably gone over this before, but let me go over it now with an actual story pole. The way that you transfer the information from a laser or an optical builder's level, or for that matter, a transit, if you're shooting just grades. But to take an instrument that shoots a level grade and then transfer that information onto your form work or your foundation or whatever it is you're referencing, you've seen me using these levels. And that's great because the grades on the bottom of these footings only had to be consistent to themselves. But the grades on these steps have to be consistent to each other and to the form work to the top of the concrete down below. So I've grabbed a one by two, it works really good, and I've set a benchmark. That is, I've, I have located where the instrument shoots at the elevation of the bottom footing. The underlying reason that I'm applying much more detail and focus to this is because each of these steps needs to be exactly a 12 inch increment from the other steps. And each of them have to be exactly a 12 inch increment above the bottom one also. So not only does it have to be consistent from this step to that one, but it has to be consistent from the last step to the first one because Simon's forms only operate in 12 inch vertical increments. Anything other than that is going to be a real problem. So we're paying attention to this. So I have here a benchmark which I'm going to circle and put top of footing at bottom. And now I'm coming down the rod because the steps are coming up. And I'm coming 24 inches and I'm writing 24. Now I'm just going to run my tape right down this thing and let it lay there. Six feet, a mark at four feet, a mark at three feet, a mark at two feet. We're going to mark a foot and we're going to mark the end of the tape. So I put this back on here and now this will register when the laser says it's in the right plane. 24 inches above this lower footing. 
did pretty good. That grade right there is just right. So I know now that the height of the concrete right here is exactly what it's supposed to be. And that the height of this bulkhead right there is exactly 12 inches, which means this is good, this is level. I'm gonna nail it to these stakes. Now we're gonna slide the rod eye down the rod, which will raise the grade to this elevation. is perfect. Right now in practical terms, the allowable tolerance on this for up and down is about an eighth of an inch probably. When I stand before you at your pearly gate, Lord, you pull out your trusty measuring tape. Please remember the only prayer for you. Just let me build a light. Square upon the truth. This stake is not in the concrete. The concrete's coming from the uphill side. It's gonna fill up to here, and it's gonna come out under here, but that stake goes into the dirt bank above that level. So I can leave this in till the next day if I want. Lord, it's your love makes the world keep on turning. Lord, your son is the fire that keeps on burning. You've just watched me use a nail gun for nailing together some forms. Now that might offend somebody who thinks that nail guns are not for form work because how do you pull them? Well, what you do is you don't put in any more nails than you need, but it puts the nails that you need in right now without shaking the whole world apart and settling your delicate grade right down into the, it's a way to go for something like this. You can see that there's kind of almost nothing holding this stuff up, but it still has to be in exactly the right spot but you have to sort of switch your mindset from using the nail gun for doing your structural framing where there's a certain minimum number of nails that is needed and frankly you should always exceed that a little bit to do do a fine job but in form work it is the nails you need and no more so these two strong backs right here are transferring the load from the top of this bulkhead and the top of that really serious bulkhead back to the bank you do that every chance you get because mother earth will always stand the load so you might work on a job where the foreman yells at you if you walk on, walk on the concrete forms. One sort of rule of thumb is if you're afraid to step on your forms, you need to do a little more beefing up of the form, which introduces the sort of underlying premise of form work. It has to be strong enough to hold the load. And hydraulic form pressure mounts at an incredible rate. Every foot that you go up vertically in a form, whether it's a single-sided form like this or a wall form, adds 150 pounds per square foot of hydraulic form pressure. So this form I'm standing on is, let's, it's two feet high and it's four feet wide. So when I come up one foot, it is pushing one foot, two foot, three foot, four times 150. There's 600 pounds of pressure along the bottom foot of that form. Now I come up the next foot to the top. There's 600 pounds of pressure along the top and there's 1,200 pounds of pressure along the bottom. So this little form I'm standing on here is gonna to have to withstand essentially 1,800 pounds. The thing that mitigates that, because you can see this form doesn't look very sturdy, does it? I mean, it's, it's enough, but it would not be enough if the whole 1,800 pounds were dropped on it at once. But we're gonna come up about halfway and then go pour somewhere else for a while and let it take an initial set at the bottom so that the rest of the load doesn't just boil out if you're hiring somebody to put in a footing under a fence or something and you come out and his bulkheads don't look exactly like this, don't bust his chops, okay? There's lots of ways to form concrete and brace it and tie it back. I, I could do a lot of this bracing with tie wire tied back to the rebar mats underneath. I, if I would have had more stakes, there, you'd see more stakes in the ground, but frankly, I'm out, okay? I've got all my stakes stuck in the ground. There is never just one way to do any of these things. But there are some underlying principles that are going to apply to any method that anybody uses. And it's never wrong if you're paying somebody to do some work on property that you own or that you're responsible for is to say, hey, talk to me about this. This looks a little light. Is this going to hold? You know, if, he's, if he gets defensive, 
you're done with him. When he's done with that job, find somebody else that's more pleasant to work with and not so insecure in their trade skill that they have to flare up whenever they're asked for some clarification on one of their processes. But in any case, where our bulkheads are in, it's time to tie some rebar. That's boring. You've already seen it. We're going to get concrete in here next week, I hope.